Well, welcome back. <laughs> yes, short, to most of us. For most of us, short little uh, break over the Easter holiday. Um, initially, we talked about having a speaker come tonight. We thought we'd kind of give you guys a little bit of break from that. Start talking about properties, do a little bit uh, more discussion than us talking at you or talking uh, just in general. So <clears throat> tonight, um, I see we've had a few more requests for um, different areas rezoning. We've started kind of a list of areas we, you know, like to talk about with a group, you know, here first informally. And then as we plan a tour to go out and kind of drive around and look at it um, and then kind of talk about, you know, do we want more people to come in? Do we want to go out and start touring around? Kind of see how we want to kind of plan out the next next few sessions. Okay. Um, before we jump into that, just kind of want to give some updates from the last meeting. Um, the Rec Master Plan has completed their review and next Wednesday, the 15th at 7 p.m., I believe, in this room. They're going to be having their public hearing on their master plan. So... Um, obviously, once that's complete, complete, um, and we'll provide you a copy. The draft is on the on the website um, already. You can look at that. Uh, April 17th, the Shadow Pines Committee completed their reports and presented it to the town board. Um, I don't know if the town board's you know taken any specific action with that yet, but um, that is complete and, and available um, online again for the committee to review. And then Jim. I don't know if you want to give a little update on where we are with the Clark House and the RFPs for that. Yeah, we uh, back in um, <clears throat> back in uh, God, it's March now. It's been several several weeks. End of March. April. End of April. We put out the beginning of April. Yeah, we put out an RFP to see what interest there would be for the Clark House and the associated buildings with the Clark House. To date, we have uh, walked through the Clark House three times with uh, prospective parties. Uh, there are two of them. Um, they're both intent on submitting an RFP. The 10th is the deadline, so it's coming up this week. Um, we'll wait to see what they do. Um, after that, the town board will take a look at the, both proposals and uh, make a determination as to whether either of them or maybe even both of them would be appropriate for the site. So that'll probably be a while, though, because we've got a lot to go through and making a determination as to who might be the appropriate one or if they're both the appropriate ones. Then they to go through the financials. Pardon? Did they give you an indication of what they would do? Yes, but I really can't tell you that right okay. at this point in time. They've asked not to do that until they okay. make their formal proposals. Um, I, I will tell you one is a restaurant and then the other one is a recreation activity. So okay. we'll leave it at that. And um, But uh, that'll happen probably this week. Uh, and certainly by the time we meet again, I'll, I'll be able to tell you exactly what's going on. Is that, uh, Clark, is the Clark, was the Clark House part, part of the greater contiguous property, or will it then need to be sub? No, it's subdivided from the old greater parcel. There's, it's a 5.6 acre parcel, per, something per, of that nature. Okay. Um, we may do some resubdivision, though, uh, as time goes on, because a portion of the parking lot falls within the other property. We may want to keep it on one parcel. Mm -hmm. We may even need to build a secondary parking lot to accommodate other users that, take, that use the park area itself. So we'll, we'll have to see what happens. That's going to be a decision the town board's going to have to wrestle with at some point in time in the future. Um, but we'll, I'll, I'll be able to give you some information, hopefully, the next time we meet. And would the town own the property and lease it out, or would they yes, sell it? Yes, the town is going to own the property. Um, one of the parties was actually interested in buying the property, and we're not intent on selling the property. Um, we're going to hold on to it. So. Jim, did you say uh, in this meeting, or maybe some other meeting, or did I just imagine this, um, that the goal would be to find somebody who would take a really long-term lease and then put the money into the improvements needed to the Clark House right. so that you would um, you would sort of discount the um, the rent on it yeah, to the, accommodate the, the fact the that... The town is committed already to doing capital improvements such as the roofing, that yeah. kind of thing. Things yeah. that really need to be done to the house to keep mm -hmm. it in good shape. <coughs> Anything that the, a potential uh, tenant would want to do They'd be responsible for the costs associated with that. Mm -hmm. uh, any type of interior decorating, that kind of thing, they'd all be responsible for that. Um, in both cases, one in one instance, uh, one person wants the three units, the Clark House, the barn, and the Clark House. The other person just wants the Clark House. So the board will have to wrestle through that. But 
Um, yes, uh, we'll be responsible for a lot of the maintenance uh, because it's ours. Uh, and it needs a lot, you know, it does need a lot of work, but then the tenants would be responsible for what they want to do to enhance it. Did that have a uh, historic designation? The Clark House itself does. The uh, cart barn does not. That was built in 94, and the barn doesn't either. Mm -hmm. Although the barn probably is eligible for designation and, and might be considered at some point in time in the future. But that's, they're all local, or it's locally designated. It's they're not, local designations. Yeah, not, right. 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 State or, not necessarily the National Register or anything like that. Right. <coughs> Any other questions? What was the gist of the Shadow Lake Committee's conclusion? Shadow Pines. Shadow Pines. Pines. Yes, I'm not going to close the other golf course. <laughs> <laughs> One um, I, I think, generally speaking, uh, the committee was looking to try and keep it a passive recreation type facility. Um, they did make some recommendations about things like uh, shelters. Um, actually, one of the recommendations I think was <coughs> utilizing the Clark House, or the, the Cart House as a shelter initially. But also looking at pavilions, potentially new lodges, just again, right. low scale recreational uses uh, was the primary recommendation out of that report. Some things that came out of it was uh, uh, frisbee golf was uh, something that yeah, was a lot that, of interest the, in. the walking, biking, biking, a lot um, of biking, um, snowshoeing, snow, um, cross country, country skiing, skiing just hiking, yeah. kind hiking. of utilizing what's there currently, and then see right. what the demand is later on um, for the land. A lot of the recommendations uh, pertain to, you know, if there were new fields that were needed uh, to look at other sites uh, on other town properties prior to looking at this site. Uh, just to so you know, turn it into just another athletic facility. complex. Yeah, avoid the complex, but right. if field, if athletic fields are necessary, <coughs> obviously there's space there. Just uh, make sure that land is used where we have it in other places as well. Uh, the recommendation was not to utilize it for things other than recreational purposes. I, you know, at one time the bus, uh, the, the school district talked about possibly looking at a bus bus facility there. Uh, you know. The community center, all of those were not library recommended for this library. None of those were recommended for that location. They were recommended for other locations first if there was an opportunity to do it somewhere else. It's online now. It was. Uh, yeah, you can actually go on. If, if, on I, I recommend that you do. Um, you should have a good feel for it before uh, before we move too much further along. Yeah, it's on through the town's yeah, website. Yeah, you can show them the more. <coughs> Boards and committees. Scroll down. We look for our it's advisory right. committee. Right. Yep. It's that one, right? That's it. Okay. Change some things box. around in there. And right at the top is the document. You can click on it. It's okay. I've seen it a lot. Well, they have it. <laughs> it does exist. So if you get a chance, I read through it. I think it's like 19 pages or 20 pages. Uh, that's not, it's not a very long document. 22, yeah. 22? We had a couple. Did they, say, did they say anything, Jim, about it? Uh, since the infrastructure is pretty much there, bringing back any bit of a passive golf use? No. Like as a public no, uh, course? They, like they, that was they specifically recommended that it not become a, a, a golf course again. Yeah, it was discussed at length over several meetings. We actually had a gentleman who wanted to uh, have a driving range there and teach golf, uh, you know, chipping, putting, that kind of thing. <clears> but <throat> mm -hmm. so we determined that the amount of area that he would need to do that, um, number one, was going to take up a lot of space where people would be walking, so it would become a, a dangerous issue for them. Secondly, um, he indicated to us that several trees would have to be put <coughs> from the site, and we've already removed several trees from the site that we didn't want to in the first place, but had to. So we, there was really not a lot of energy on, on our part to move forward with them. So. I think the group was okay, you know, if you want to do golf lessons out of the maintenance building and have a little chipping, chipping and putting green, but he said, you know, the driving range, you know, had to be part of whatever his model was. You take your lesson, then go outside and yeah. practice. And, and when you look at what that area was already offering, in terms of the recreational uses, keeping the driving range there wasn't, well, I was in the strategically wrong location on the property as well. It's right smack dab in the middle where people were going to interact in terms of working on the back nine and walking along and hiking and everything else. Mm -hmm. So it just wasn't a good situation. 
Did you, there was a couple references in there about the Shale Lake reclamation plan when the Dolomite's done with their quarry. Well, <laughs> do we have any more insight on that? Two different things. I mean, well, I misspoke. I misspoke. Well, I, I mean, there, I, I, I talk to Dolomite a lot, and Dolomite right. right now has no intention of closing that quarry for any reason. Uh, they were looking at utilizing it for the next 30 years for stone, mm -hmm. but their intent is not to even close it then because they want to continue to utilize it for asphalt. And um, it's just strategically located in such a way in this county that it's, it's easy access for the state DOT and whoever else needs to get asphalt. So I don't anticipate any of us ever going to see that quarry closed in our lifetimes, to be perfectly honest. Because it, it seems like there's been a lot of comments lately that you know, if, they, if they do flood the lake, well, well it's the other thing that's interesting when we had our, that we should be thinking about we had a, a meeting um, back in November with the uh, committee that we're just referring to here and it was interesting because Zach and I got to meet a gentleman uh, who I'd not met before but he was a former DEC officer who was working in their mining division and he was telling Zach and I that he had been doing a study around the state of New York about these quarries that are closed down and everybody thinks they're all going to fill up with water right to the very edge, and you can kind of like walk off the edge and go swimming and that kind of thing, or boating. It's not the he reality. Said, he said almost all of them never get to more than a, a two-thirds or halfway up where they're supposed to be. So it would be interesting to see what happens if they ever turn the pumps off in that quarry. Right. You might have a 40 or 50-foot face drop down into the water before you're done. So you could do cliff diving then. <laughs> But, I mean, ultimately, well, that, that entire thing you're referencing falls to the DEC. I mean, there's not a lot the town can do. I mean, back in with the 70s, to that. we right. had the reclamation plans, um, but DEC took them over statewide, so it falls under their jurisdiction. They permit them to operate as a quarry. Um, they also hold the reclamation plan of you know, when and if they're done, you know, what's the restoration back to. So there's no deadline. Not at all. As a matter of fact, the deadline, if there's ever going to be one, is going to be long, long after you right. uh, I mean, it's something, I mean, we can talk about it, have conversations about, but I don't think there's anything that's going to be, at least at this very moment, pending that, you know, that's going to, in the next 10, 20, 30 years, going to be done, and, you know, what do you do with it then? I mean, it's still a viable property. Right. Dolomite still owns it. They own most of the homes around it um, as Dolomite property as well, so I would assume, you know, they would have an intent to do something with, with that at you know at that time. But uh, my, my other question is, did we ever rezone the other golf courses? No, no. and we're going to talk about that. that Actually, we're, going to we, we're not going to talk about it tonight, only because I'm going to bring. I had had an opportunity to meet with the owner of the golf course very recently and told him I'd like to bring him in and have him talk to you about what his intent is, what he's been doing, what they've been doing with the uh, the. Uh, facility over there over the last several months because of the fire and um, he's going to come in and give us uh, some background on that and then we're going to go out and take a look at it with you as a group and then make some decisions. We've got Penfield Country Club too, right? It's still zoned mm -hmm. single family? Uh, yeah. It's zoned single family but it's zoned R1 which means that they have to have an acre per lot uh, in order to develop and there's a lot of wetland on that property as well uh, which kind of limits uh, some of the development that could occur there but we'll take a look at those as well. You know, one of the things that uh, jumps out at me um, is the fact that when Dolomite built Shadow Lake, they did that because a lot of kids were going over to the, the, the quarry over there that was over there, which is now, we know, a Shadow Lake. But back in the day, it was just this wild area. Kids were getting hurt. Kids were doing Mr. stupid Parker things. Kids, church kids, kids were dying. And... Dolomite said, that's enough of this. We're not putting up with this anymore. Their attorneys were saying your risk liabilities are astronomical here to do something. That is why they decided to turn that into a golf course, because they had the ability, number one, to get rid of the risk, and number two, they could make a profit off of it. So that's what's happened there. Yes? Um, there's currently apparently a bill pending approval by one or more yes. houses of the legislature. Um, that really has the potential to wreak some havoc with golf courses, um, R2 especially. Yep. Um, <clears throat> basically, the, the concept is that right now they're assessed as golf courses and that's how they're valued. This bill would require the land to be assessed for its maximum value. value. Best highest and best use. Which so if I, it were zoned as yeah. R120 or half acre lots, that's how you would zone that land. So the question, so, I guess, that's I how you have, tax that land. 
is should we be reaching out to the golf courses and asking them, is there anything we can do to help you? <coughs> I mean, I don't know if this bill is going to pass or not. I don't either. Um, but it'd be interesting to hear the owner talk a little bit about what, what his thoughts on that issue are. I'm sure he's research. very I'm sure if it's pending. Yeah, I'm yeah. Sure. I mean, a lot of the, especially downstate, a lot of the golf courses. Well, even here, they interviewed uh, the people on Lakeshore up in Greece, and they're like, "If this passes, we're toast." They'll close the golf courses. Yeah. There's no question. Stand a chance. Well, I don't. I hope. Uh, That's a very good point. Yeah, I hope this bill doesn't pass. But I mean, if it does. I don't know how zoning decisions might affect that for them. It's a good point. Good to know. Good to, good to keep on. We are going to bring uh, Fritz Oden back in. I've talked to him. He's more than willing to come in. He'd like to talk to you and give you an update as to what he's been doing. And we'll probably talk about this, Matt. Uh, it's a major issue in the state mm -hmm. of New York right now. Death to fight for a lot of golf courses. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else? Anything else on any any miscellaneous business we have to take care of? Pines. I say we can kind of yeah. next jump into the request that we had. We did this kind of once before. Here's some requests we've had. We're not asking to make a decision tonight. We're not asking to you know, get that deep in, but just as we kind of go through, here's some of the areas, and then we've kind of just as our discussions of. You know, we've looked at a few areas that we don't think are zoned right for what it is currently, um, you know, that maybe should be changed, and other areas that are kind of buffer areas that, you know, are kind of, uh, you know, transitional as well. So we're going to kind of run through a few of those, but, you know, we can keep the, the discussion going. No, I'm fine. Uh, we can share. So if Zach wants to fly us around the middle. <coughs> Why don't we fly to Empire Boulevard first? We want to kind of work our way across the town. Give me a moment, because I want to have the PDF open, too. And, and as Mark says, we're not so. asking you to make any decisions. We're just looking at these as, as sites that we want you to look at when we go out in the field to get a feel for. And then we can make some uh, discussion uh, as to what you think about it. Um, uh, we're on Empire Boulevard. Um, and I, I want to start, I don't know, I'd rather start down here. I'd this start. is the map there, Sean. Let me pull up yeah. an aerial. <clears throat> Where do you want to start? Thompson? I want to start down no, uh, by the cells. Okay, there. Get this map. All right, that's good. All right, so <coughs> let me get the TH on. Oh, that was what we proposed. This is proposed, we're just, so I'm starting here. Yeah, let's we're not do that. I don't, I don't want to prejudice them in any way, and I don't want them to get a preordained feeling about what it should or shouldn't be. So there's some properties around town that when, when they were zoned years ago, some of the properties were it, the zoning cut through the middle of them in some cases mm -hmm. and it's it's kind of caused some havoc because uh, you can develop higher densities along the road and then all of a sudden you've got r120 in this particular case of 1423 empire boulevard if you flip your maps over it shows the existing zoning to help paint a picture for jim's uh conversation oh, absolutely. sorry so <coughs> zach's got his cursor right here this splits this property in half now there's there's a lot of problems associated with this property um some of you who've been around a long long time might remember that back in the 80s 90s uh the turkish society of rochester actually got an approval to build a mosque on this property um once the approval was granted they started doing some um soil testing and ge uh, geo uh geotechnical. Ge geotechnical analysis of the site and determined that um, some of Empire Boulevard along here back in the 40s and 50s, uh, several people, the city of Rochester being one, dumped uh, a lot of uh, coal ash uh, along the right of way of Empire Boulevard to get rid of it on uh, the city furnaces. This area was one of those sites, and when they went down, they determined they would have to go down like 70 feet to be able to hit virgin soil to be able to put a footer in for a mosque that was going to be a fairly heavy structure. So that didn't happen there, and they, as you know, they, they relocated out to Gates, uh, and this has been sitting there vacant now for a long time. It does not mean that they can't build on it. As a matter of fact, these properties just to the left of it are all in the same situation, but they're, you can tell that they're all smaller buildings, they're all one-story buildings, 
They were built with something called a spread footer, which allows for the weight to be distributed over the, the base of the, of the uh, flooring. Um, they've all been in good shape all the years I've been here. They were here before I was here. Um, so they're all batting 40, 50 years at this point in time. Um, but we're looking at this property as kind of a, an awkward situation because it is developable to a point, um, but there needs to be some kind of a transitional use that uh, takes it away from commercial on one side to residential on the other. So we want you to take a look at that when the time comes and come up with some ideas that you think are appropriate. Um, so the, the, the yellow hatching is the low sales landing district. Um, it allows uh, apartments, restaurants, uh, that type of stuff, not heavy commercial. Um, and then you've got kind of a gray area in the 1423 is single family residential. So you can see there's that divide <coughs> line between the property. It's kind of in a no man's land between being, is it apartments and restaurant or is it single family residential? And it just. And it abuts single family residential. And it abuts single family residential. So. And there's no other way to get to it other than through the Empire Boulevard access point, which is in the, the sales landing district. So, so it's an awkward it's situation. It's just kind of in a limbo. Is it needs to kind of either go one way or the other just to make it a usable property for somebody to, to transition to something else. Has Zach got any other encumbrances on it? Like there, it's got or? some steep slopes. Zach's got steep the... Steep slopes? Those yeah. are the 10-footers. So it's kind of got a flat plateau at the top at the end of Mance Lane, Morning Woods, excuse me, Mance is over. End of Morning Woods has kind of got a flat plateau up there, and then it kind of drops down, and then it's kind of got a, a buildable area, you know, you'd see along Empire Boulevard. How about along the boulevard? How much of that? Or you can get in. Uh, uh, there's access to, to it. it. Well, uh, you'll have to do some grading and cut back the slopes. Is that affected by the floodplain? No, it's not that side. No. no, it's or, actually uh, quite high. Uphill. As you're coming up the hill on the right, you pass the Bird Birds Unlimited, whatever. It's just past that kind of on that right side as you're coming up the hill. It's a tough site, uh, but it's, it's there. We get a lot of people calling year after year after year trying to do something, but it never works out. So, Yeah, what do you mean, something else? Well, we've had people that have looked at it for townhouse development. We've had apartments. We've had uh, commercial users. Again, we're not comfortable with all that because there's, there's got to be some kind of a transitional use between the two. Uh, we don't want to throw a, an apartment building up next to... Uh, 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 residential see, and they see the, and they the third own, story and other people, to their second story. And other people see the zoning as, you know, sales landing and residential, they kind of, well, what does that mean? Or they kind of forget the residential component of what R120 is. They just see the greatest, most profitable, mm -hmm. uh, you know, use that they could put on there, even <coughs> on, on the whole property. So it's a constant battle for us. Well, we'll talk about some uses that, you know, you might like or you might not like and we'll just try to work through it and see what's going on. Who is it? Um, it's owned now by a gentleman by the name of uh, Mesut Vardor. He bought it from the guy who owned it that was going to develop the mouse there. So he's had it for several years now um, and he'd like to do something with it. He's, <coughs> he's been in fairly recently trying to figure out what to do and he, he submitted a letter. requested this group to yeah. talk about it and come up with you know, some thoughts or ideas of what it could be. <laughs> but I think, again, just being between two districts makes it difficult. You know, he's got no clear path one way or the other with it splitting it. So I think he'd rather determine at least to be all of one <clears throat> zoning and at least he could do something with it at that point. Well, what is the most accessible way to hit that market? Empire. Empire? Yeah. Which is not easy, but it, it's the most accessible way. There's really no other way you can get to it from Morning Woods or from Mance Lane. Uh, without going through somebody's yard, and that's just not going to happen. Yeah, I didn't know if there was a planned cut through there. At the end of the yeah, that's a good point, too. As Rob's talking about back here, uh, where all these other areas are, it starts to fall off dramatically. Um, and this is kind of a problem. It's kind of an interesting story. I'm glad you brought it up. Back in 1983, um, the Melly Brothers owned all this property that you see here in the back, which is zoned R120 as well. Out in front, they had the, it wasn't LaSalle's Lending then, it was general business or it was commercial. You could basically do anything you wanted in commercial zones back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s here. And they did. I mean, they had sandblasting operations. Uh, they had all sorts of things going on there. When they came in, they asked for a use variance from the Zoning Board of Appeals because the comment was, we would love to develop the back portion of that property as residential, but we can't send anybody through an industrial complex to get to a $350,000 house. 
So we would like to do a, a use variance. And use variances are very, very difficult to get, if ever, because you've got to demonstrate that the property in question can't yield you a reasonable return based on its zoning. It took two years to get the variance, but they got it because they were able to demonstrate that there was no other way to get into that property other than through Empire Boulevard. They would have had to go through sand blasting plants and the auto painting shops and all sorts of other crazy things. So they did get it, but the board said, this goes back to what we were just talking about in this other property, the board said, you are abutting residential properties. Um, and they've been, we had a lot of complaints about that over the years because it was so noisy at night, there were no hours of operation that, that limited them. So they said, we're going to give you an approval for mini storage warehousing, which ironically at that time was kind of just coming into its own. And they, that's what they wanted. So they gave them a mini storage warehousing variance. And they've been building it now. As you can see, it's starting to take place. It's kind of worked out really well because it's a quiet operation. Nobody usually is there. It solved the neighborhood noise issue. It solved the traffic generation to the site because it's very difficult to get in and out of there. Um, so it kind of did a couple of nice things for that area. And um, it's kind of gotten it back to a point now where it's a cleaner site than it was back in the day before they started doing it. So it kind of worked out well. I'm not so certain I want to see a use variance granted for up in this area here because you never know what they're going to come in for. Um, but if they use the same formula that they use for down here, they might very well be able to apply for one and get it. So let's see. <coughs> let's go up the hill a little bit. <coughs> Another one that jumps out at us. Um, this area, you'll remember, is the Hilltop Farm Market as you're coming up the hill. For years, they used to have all the old statues and everything there. <laughs> it was kind of a, it so was a farm a market in a sense, but it really kind of wasn't, but it's been there forever, so it was a pre-existing non-conforming condition. Back in 1980, the town, as part of its overall comprehensive plan, recommended this property be zoned R112, which was a smaller lot, thinking that they could get maybe some units on that property. People would be interested in living there, but nobody's been interested in living along Empire Boulevard in a single-family detached unit. Just one person. Um, Mr. Bauman, who Russell Bauman, who lived there up until last year, he died at the age of 100. Really nice guy. Uh, kind of kept control of the property. He had the guys that were running the farm market up until a few years ago when they got sick and elderly and they couldn't do it anymore. That closed down. Then we had another guy who took it over and kind of fixed it up last year and the year before. He's not interested in utilizing it as a farm market anymore because it's really not that profitable at that location. We're going to look to you to come up with some ideas as to what might be an appropriate use for that property. Um, the back of the property abuts uh, single-family residences on Littlewood Lane. You can see there's a changing grade from Littlewood Lane's backyard to 440, then down to 430, down to 420 and down to 410 and then 400 on Empire Boulevard. So there is a change in grade in the backs coming down to Empire Boulevard. And something to keep in mind with this property is it's not just adjacent to residential. It has MR, which is multiple residence, limited business directly across the street, and LaSalle's Landing. Um, so a transitional use here has a wide variety of options in terms of our zoning ordinance, not just uh, the residential use. And of course, whatever it is, we would look to have some kind of a buffer at that 430 mark, probably. It's got to probably be from that point inward to try and keep that as natural as possible as a buffer from mm -hmm. All right, heading north. <coughs> want to go over to Bay Road? Yeah, I just didn't Something want to on it anymore. We had a, a request from a gentleman who owns some property on Bay Road. I don't, I'm not quite sure what his intent is at this point in time, but he owns the properties. Those three properties right there are on the west side of Bay Road, south of Leedale Drive. They are zoned residential, as are the properties on Leedale Drive. The properties just south of him are zone limited business. There's a hair salon right next to his house um, for the main structure. He has a vacant property in the middle and I think his intent is to try and do something other than a single family residential. I don't know if it warrants that or not, but you know, we said that we would look at it with you as a group to determine whether or not that was appropriate. So we'll be looking at that site as well. If you have any questions while we're going along, you want me to pull up like a Google Street view of this? Yeah. Let me know. It just will take a second to get there. 
Is that, can you, oh, you want to go could you just there? sort of overlay the map that we see with that just or oh. kind of put them side by side just so we can see exactly? It's kind of hard to. Yeah, this is so. Such, some <coughs> detail on this map. Yes. Hold on a second. I think I know where you are, but. Yep. That's your trouble. Okay. We are. Right. There at the top corner of the town. Ah, uh, okay. So it's the transition from the current LB in an MR zone. So that's the um, Kid Castle way, and then the senior living right. components kind of behind it. And then you've got a frontage of a couple of different businesses. You got what's it, Bay Vista Taqueria is on the corner right now, yeah. and then you know, it was the Euro place, and then there was you know, some hair salons yeah. and some other stuff in those businesses that kind of go along. The last one um, looks residential but it's a hair salon on the end mm -hmm. and then it kind of jumps you know more into residential there so you got to decide you know what is the break and you know if you rezone the other couple of parcels now you're up to Leedale what is that now you got a domino effect that where does that go at Leedale and yeah. so it's it's always tricky where do you draw the line and where do you, you can see those th those three and just the, before you get the Leedale but, uh, see how they fit in they're white and they fit in with the other ones that are white as well so rolling what do you have? What did he, uh, did he indicate what he might have in mind? I think he wanted to run a business or do something with it, but I don't know if we got anything specific <laughs> on what he was. And it's a tight site as well. I mean, it's it's only like 66 feet wide, so it's not a He sees, he sees LB on the map, so he's thinking I could continue his LB is probably his. What's your area requirements in that zone, for that zone? For LB? Yeah. Well, really, 65% uh, lot coverage is your biggest restrictor on well, all types of development. Do you have a minimum? <laughs> no, we don't have a minimum no. lot size. You just have setback requirements. Setbacks, setback requirements. lot coverage. Area requirement, you know, lot requirements. He probably would probably subdivide 1177 into 1179. Yeah, resubdivide. Yeah. I, I have no idea what he's going to do, but we'll take a look at that and see what... We've not heard anything from 1175, so that's a single-family house that... You know, and I, I guess... The question I have is, do you want them to either be at the site when you're there, or do you want them to come here and talk to us, or are you not interested in talking to them at all? I mean, do you want to see it first, and then if you want further follow-up, then we That's can ask questions. That's probably the better way to go. Yeah. Let, the, let the committee look at it. We can yeah. drive it. We can look. I mean, obviously, you can drive it on your own if, you know, as we're talking about it, but, you know, as a group, we can drive out there, look at it, assess it, and then if the group has more questions and want to bring them in, we can schedule bringing people in and share their thought of the how and the whys of right. what they think it, it meets the merits of. I mean, in all fairness, to ultimately, you know, maybe later here, yeah, hear him out, see what, he, what his intention That's going to be up to you as to how you what want to handle it. I, yeah. be, I don't want to put it in a position where you're arguing with the guy out in his front yard. No. Yeah. But by the same token, I agree, if you want to bring him back in here, and talk to him about his ideas that that's probably another way. Well, we're could. not doing the rezoning, we're only, you know. You're making recommendations of it. Yeah. Or you're not, one of the two. I yeah, mean, and, and you're not obligated to, you know, just because somebody asked for something, you're not obligated to give it to them. We're just something. proposing possible direction, right. depending. That's right. Know, so yeah. it's, but to hear him out and just see what his intentions are. Uh, yeah, but should I would like to see it first with that. Yes, I, I agree you should. Sort of and I think you should see it just in the vacuum and look at it yourself. And then we'll be able to talk to him afterwards, I agree. Uh, talk to okay. the owners afterwards. So as we look at these properties, or prepare to look at these properties and try to decide how they should be zoned, what objective criteria are we taking into consideration? Well, the, the thing you're looking at is how, how would a potential rezoning adversely impact the areas around it? I mean, if somebody just wants to rezone something next to a single-family mm -hmm. residence, now he, this guy right here is a good example. He's he has a business next to him to the south, abutting this house. I don't know if he even lives there. He might he might rent this place for all I know. But if we were to move that up two two notches, now all of a sudden that puffer is at somebody else's property. It's like taking a beaver out of one creek and putting him in another one. You just move the problem up to another creek. Uh, you haven't solved it. So you start the creek. Yeah, and, well, and then you've got to worry about the creeping effect or the domino yeah. effect, if you will. Uh, and then as, as we've discussed in this group uh, many a times, you can rezone up to MR, TH, LB, whatever, but you can't dictate, well, if it was only a hair salon next to them, we'd be okay with that. That's just fine. Well, there's a whole lot of other things that come in, you know, if you want to rezone it to a, a B&R, 
it could be a hair salon, but it could, it could be, be a bank. A bank, or it could be urgent you know, care. Something else. That's the stuff that you know we don't know and you know can't dictate you know how that turns out. So that's all the stuff we got to look at is you know what falls into that. that and we will, uh, we'll be there with you. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about it. We'll have the ordinance with us and we'll look at the options and see what you think. Well, that's some of the other areas we're looking at. Is you know are there other other areas that single family residential is not I won't say reasonable anymore. Um, you know, but is that a reasonable spot for somebody to live? As roads get busier, traffic gets heavier. You know, maybe those don't make sense to be single family <coughs> residential anymore, and maybe it should be more of commercial or townhouse or multi residential or something. And that's some of the areas we've kind of highlighted as traffic patterns increase. Um, you know, maybe that doesn't make the place for a single family house to be anymore. And, you know, it's, it's, well, why did the change do you require against a residential zone area? Well, that's a big problem we run into with these, these residences. Uh, there are buffering requirements, but ideally you're talking about a 50 foot buffer yeah. for a limited business zone but you're talking about a property that's probably you know 100 feet wide and you can't the utilize 30, without a variance yeah, so we run into, the town board had that problem because uh, the 2010 group listed several locations where they recommended rezonings of single family homes and, and it was justified the town board thought it was justified as well but you had 100 by 200 foot lots across the street from Whiteman's on 441 and they had to make a lot of allowances to allow that to occur in terms of we had a grand variance system for just about every single property, which we did, but there was rationalization for doing that. But it's not the perfect world where you have 50 foot or 100 foot buffers from each other because you just don't have those kind of lots. Plus, we start with an 80 foot front setback on those two, so automatically you're left with next to nothing. And that's right. And, you know, you, you're providing nothing for the property owner at that point in time. So why'd you bother rezoning the land? You know? And Jim and Mark. It Correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't necessarily have to. I mean, this committee can make a recommendation to explore right. alternative right. Uh, zoning options. It does not have to be anything that's currently in code. But if that's right, okay, uh, we, that's that's a very good point because back in 2000, they looked at creating new zoning districts. Uh, some of them went into effect, some of them didn't, um, just based on um, what the need was. So you're right; it doesn't necessarily have to happen that way. And then they're part of it too. Again, somebody mentioned it a minute ago. It's a recommendation. You know, it's going to go to the town board. The town board might have 20 different reasons why that recommendation should either go or should not go, depending on what it knows about the properties around it and, and the impacts that it might have to uh, the neighbors around I mean, it. So. Could it warrant a isolated multiple use type situation? You know, yeah. we're just going to have to look at various options to see if they if they fit. If they don't fit, then we just go on and, and look at the other sites. Um, you wanted to go to Creek Street? This is you. That's Creek Street. Creek yeah, Street. Side. We had a request to resolve. Oh, the one I brought up? Yeah, yeah. it kind of it kind of goes into your your bay, uh, your Creek Plank and Empire cause. Yeah, this this is kind of an interesting area. It was interesting back in 2010 as well. Um, I spent a lot of time on Creek Street and and, um, and Plank Road and. Um, Creek Street from Plank Road to Empire Boulevard at one time was kind of starting to look a little seedy. And uh, I thought to myself, you know, if the people are not going to take care of their properties here, it's because either they're, they're not willing to do it because they're not getting what they think out of it anymore or the traffic's too much for it and they don't think it's residential. That being said, over the last couple of years, I've started to notice that it is being taken care of better. Then I was a little nervous because I thought that if the west side of the street were rezoned, You've got the east side of the street, which is still a solid residential track neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And now you've put them in a position where they're looking across the street at non-residential uses, which generate more traffic. They, they take away from the character of a residential neighborhood. My initial reaction, we did get somebody looking to ask if it could be rezoned um, to a business use. I think they were looking at some kind of a hair cutting business or sure. something. Yeah, that's right, this property. So, I mean, in fairness, I mean, I'll try to be as objective about this as possible. I, you know, we'll take you there to look. Um, I'm not quite sure in my mind that I'm excited about rezoning that property. This it still has a residential feel to the area on that road. It does, and, uh, I mean, you know, and they are taking care of their properties. <laughs> the same was true on Plank Road between Empire Boulevard and Creek Street. And, you know, maybe it's just because uh, you're looking at it in uh, January and then all of a sudden when all the leaves pop out and everything, it starts to look nice again. But the big problem that's occurred on this street is half the street is actually zoned business use, leaving the other half as residential. There's uh, actually a, 
I think it's a four unit apartment on 495. And then you've got a single family to the east of that. Yeah, that's a four unit apartment. And there is a lot of traffic being built up on that street. We might have to go look at that at a, at a peak period uh, that it's going to be a pain in the butt for you, but we may have to do that. They may not be getting out of that property um, the value that it, it would have been worth had they not had the traffic out there that they had, they're having. So I want you to take a look at that site and get an idea of what you think about that particular stretch of uh, Plank Road. I wouldn't recommend going anywhere beyond Creek Street. Well, we've got the property. <coughs> and we Dayton's own the School property. The, the, the uh, Dayton's Corner Schoolhouse is there. Um, so there's a good transitional use right there to stop it from moving forward to the east. But I'd like you to take a look at that, particularly during a peak period in the afternoon, and see what your thoughts are regarding that. What else? <coughs> Uh, go to, you want to go uh, south of Panorama or you want to go over to 250? Let's go east and then we'll go. Let's go to 250. Go around the road. This was a uh, request for a uh, rezone? Yep. Walsh's Market. All right, so you, you may be familiar with uh, Walsh's Market. Uh, uh, it's been out there for a long, long time. The property is sitting right now in the middle of an RA2 zoning district. Uh, there's interest in developing that property for residential purposes. Uh, I, is he looking at, um, what's he looking at for a rezoning request? I think just a higher density. Obviously they've got the Felbo Funeral Home to the south of them. Uh, you know, so I think the feeling was it's a, on 250 in the state road with a funeral home to the south. You know, is the potential there for single-family houses or you know, more for multi-family, whether can you townhouses or there? apartments or something else into that area? You can see that uh, Abington Place was built here. It's almost done now. We were just out there a few minutes ago looking at it. Um, it's almost near completion. There's like 102 houses there. That was a senior patio home project. Sanitary sewers are coming in from Webster. Um, all this area would be served by Webster Sanitary Sewers, <coughs> and he's looking to. I think he's looking to possibly develop the area south of uh, Abington and the back portion of the funeral home, if I'm not mistaken. I thought you had told us before that Webster Sewers are at capacity. They're at capacity. Right Currently, now. they are. <coughs> um, they're working on the the treatment plant there. So, but within the next ten years they'll have their treatment plant resolved. So currently, yes, we're not sending any more units or development um, you know, into Webster until we hear from them. But as we're looking out 10 years, in the next two years, they should have their treatment plant resolved. And you know, we're going to get a lot of requests after that as, hey, OK, now Webster's available. What about this parcel? What about this parcel? So now it's very timely to look at these. Are they right zoned right now? If they are, they are. Um, you know, but now is the time to look at these properties. You know, for years, we've had requests on the northeast side of Marchner in 250 um, to develop that property to townhouses or something you're abutting or getting close to the village of, of Webster. Um, we've had requests for that. Um, but you know, these are the things that we're looking out 10 years. Once sewer capacity is available, you know, what do you see you know, this area developing into? Continuing single family residential. Um, these couple of units, um, they are more dense than what zoning has been, but that was through incentive zoning. So as you're looking at them, those lots, um, both um, Zach's got an Abington, as well as uh, Barclay to the north, as you look at lot sizes, those are not R120 or RA2 units. Um, you know, they're smaller than that because it went through an incentive zoning process. So they basically, um, you know, for an additional fee, got a higher density, and that paid for some drainage improvements in the area that paid for some other benefits that benefited the neighborhood. You know, the town board weighed that and said, yeah, the benefit to you know, replacing this culvert to improving some existing issues we have is offset by you know, some additional units in that area. That's not done often, um, but it has changed. Those are not obviously two acre lots that are out there currently, but that was done through a little bit of a different process. Um, could, could you refresh our memories about the, um, the process? It seemed like a sort of a bit of a chicken and egg process in terms of um, sewer, extending sewer, sewer capacity, development, preserving land. I mean, it seemed like this sort of interconnected right. thing. And this is like, 
you know, critical to sort of have in mind, I think, as we're looking at areas like this. Could you just kind of refresh our memories and sort of what Yeah, obviously, sanitary water? sewer installation drives development. Without it, you're not going to have high density development. That's why East Benfield is what it is right now, because there has not been well, any we, sewer We capacity. require at least an acre of a parcel for sanitary sewers, and right. I think so does the health department. Right. Um, two is better or more, just you know, make sure you got perks in the area to expand your septic in the future. Right. So that kind of sets, it. if you're at a minimum acre lot, you know, that kind of restricts a lot of the development that currently we see, you know, people are not looking for one acre parcels or most of the developers not looking to develop one acre parcels. No, and I think back in the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s when I came here, the intent at one point in time, everybody, the whole town was zoned half acre, if you remember we talked about that early on. Mm -hmm. The whole town was zoned half acre, yet people were building septic systems next to each other and there was horrible septic problems. There were whole neighborhoods that were having like one gigantic leaf field in their backyards. And the town board rezoned the properties to R1 and RA2. I think the R1 uh, thought process was, look, there, there are sanitary sewers fairly close to these areas. It's going to take 10, 20, 30 years to get there, but they will eventually. Uh, that would give them the ability to get higher density if that were the case. Um, the ones out in East Penfield, you know, when we looked at where the sewers were coming from, there are no sewers coming in from, uh, uh, from Wayne County. Uh, they don't have enough for themselves alone to give us sanitary access. Very few <coughs> sewers were out in Parrington at that, that depth of uh, where you know, the county is. And the same was true in Webster. They just didn't have any capacity. There's been little bits of it here and there over the last 30, 40 years. Still, most of, if not all of these Penfield is not serviceable at this point in time by sanitary sewers. So it probably makes good sense just to kind of leave it the way it was. Um, we did get these little pockets like uh, where Abington Places and where Alden Glen was, where they were able to get higher density um, because they were abutting uh, a higher density with the town of Webster. The sewers were coming in from Webster, so they had the ability to tie into those. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, most of East Penfield is not accessible at this point in time. And we don't know, as Mark says, 10 years from now, there might be sewer capacity all over the place, but right now there isn't. And until Webster figures out what it's going to do with its sewers, um, we're kind of in limbo right now. Well, I guess my question is, what, what drives, what factor drives the um, commitment, because it's a huge commitment, density to... Well, on a developer's part, or on um, well, both, because obviously it's got to be the well, it's kind of driven municipalities it's, and the developers. It's, it's kind of, of an add-on type thing. thing. If the sewer goes in by a developer, the mm -hmm. town generally does never, never build sanitary sewers, okay. unless we're having some problem. Back in the seventies, the government, federal government, had programs where this is what happened when we were all on half acre. Right. You could go in and get a grant, and then go in and fix it. And you had to pay half; they paid half to mm -hmm. solve the problem. George's neighborhood is one of them. George's not here tonight to oh, comment yeah. on it. Yeah. But White Village was one of the last <coughs> neighborhoods of an old development that um, did on not the have west side of town. On the west mm -hmm. side of town, did not have sanitary sewers. That was more of a retrofit back. Mm -hmm. um, so they petitioned through a, a development of a uh, district. Mm -hmm. All of them were willing to pay an amount to put that sanitary. Well, I shouldn't say all of them. The majority of them were willing to pay an amount to put that sanitary <coughs> sewer in, and that's how it happened. But for us to go in and to say, oh, we're going to put a sewer over there and let development occur, that does not happen. Like mixed use, for example, there isn't sanitary sewers installed there. Mm -hmm. Every developer knows that cost is on them to bring the sanitary sewers, providing they can get the return on that through dense development to bring in said infrastructure. Without that agreement and that understanding between a town and developer, then it goes nowhere. And there's a lot of diminishing returns. If, if I'm a developer here, and the sanitary sewer is sitting where you are, mm -hmm. and it's just not going to make it worth my effort to bring that sewer down here mm -hmm. because I'm not going to get the profit out of the project that I, mm -hmm. that I normally would, I'm not going to do it. Now, if somebody's here and they say, hey, I can afford to do that and bring it here and tie in, mm -hmm. now all of a sudden it's gotten a little closer to you, so the next guy might say, I'll do it. And by the time you get done, that's how it eventually gets to you. But it doesn't, it doesn't go this far to that far because uh, somebody just wants to put it in. It's got to make money in order to do it. And then, how um, how does how is it determined what the capacity of the system is to tie other stuff into it? I guess that's yep. the other question. We have we get sewer studies done, and we're actually looking again at the, the mixed use areas. We actually go out and put flow meters in manholes, um, mm -hmm. so you can see peaks and valleys of people are taking showers in the mornings, using mm -hmm. toilets. 
and then in the evenings they're using dishwashers and laundry and everything else so you can see what the capacity of the pipes are so we actually put flow meters in manholes down the way and then you see you know what is the pipes being surcharged what are the size of the pipes what's the slope of the pipes so basically we create a we don't we typically hire that out a 3d model of what's in the area and by the time you get to the end of the line either you're coming out of the ground because just gravity doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. <coughs> You've exceeded the capacity of a downstream pump station, so you know, kind of a, a bunch of limiting factors. Is the pump station not able to handle more flow to it? Is the pipe size under gravity flow, you know, exceeding the full capacity of it? Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of where we run to the end of lines and say, okay, we've got no more capacity in this. But then typically through the study, we say, okay, if you make updates or upgrades to said pump station, you know, that pump station may need you know, bigger and better pumps that may need, you know, a new force main and may need something else, then it's up to the developer to say, you know, the, the property's not valuable enough at this time for it, I'll wait five years and then as the value of land comes, you know, something else changes, Jim said, somebody else adds sewer in between there, then, you know, that cost benefit you know, breaks with them. So we try to do the studies in the background to make sure as new development comes in, it doesn't back up and, you know, flood your basement or we don't have capacity in you know, somebody else's. So we try to have you know, studies done in the background and as the developer comes in and says, okay, we project we've got this many units left in this district. You know, and then we've always had it as a first come, first serve basis. We don't hold sewer back and say, you know, Rowan's had that piece of property forever. You know, he's got a hundred units coming to him. It's, you know, the next next guy up or the next person in. If you use the sewer capacity, then, you know, it's up to Harold to, you know, his project comes in and he may have to do some pump station upgrades or do something else but we also always have people bring or extend the sanitary sewer to their property line so at least they do their part they do their piece most people say well i'm just gonna bring it to my building and stop well no you're gonna bring it from your one property line to your other property line at least leave a manhole so the next man or woman in line can pick it up there and then you know right. take it to their okay. their property so we at least have that's your minimum requirement is to service yourself but also to extend it you know to your most reasonable property line that we, would make sense for where to extend from there. But also if one goes in, like for example, we had a sketch plan come in last, nope, March. <coughs> March we had a sketch plan come in for a property on Jackson and Plank and they're proposing a, a sanitary sewer system for that. It was a low pressure force main, so grinder pumps for each house, but a sewer that's not just wide open, it's actually a smaller pipe. Mm -hmm. When we look at that, where's it gonna go? Well, they're proposing to bring it down Plank to Shoecraft which is a stretch, it's a run yeah, to get absolutely. there, but there's a lot of uh, houses between sure. there and the, that project site. Mm -hmm. Again, all in concept form, nothing has formally been done <coughs> for that because they're still trying to figure out if, it's, if they can keep moving with that project. Mm -hmm. um, but we look at that and we say, all right, we're not just servicing that site, we have to be able to allow the other neighbors along Plank to tie into that. Mm -hmm. So let's make sure that that is sized accordingly mm -hmm. so that when the time comes, they can tie in, get off the septic systems, mm -hmm. abandon those, and now they have the sanitary sewer service for their house. So there's a lot of different elements clearly going yeah. into each. We just had one before the town board uh, just last week. Um, the new uh, home leasing property just north of the YMCA wants to put in a pump station. He said, you know, we'll take acceptance ownership of it if you put in its size to handle the sewer capacity in the region. So you've got to size the pump station to that, you've got to size it and design it to our standards, you've got to size the force main downstream. Mm -hmm. So it's you know, their cost, if they could have put it in a little private, if it's theirs, they'll own it and maintain it forever, or if mm -hmm. you want the town to own it and take care of it, you need to size it bigger and put in bigger pumps and bigger storage tanks and everything else, which then provides capacity for everybody else. But then we'll take it over to the sewer district, will maintain that cost through the overall you know, sewer fee in, in town. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's cyclical. I mean, your neighborhood soon may need replacement of sanitary sewer. People mm -hmm. say, well, why should I pay for Michael's new sewer to go in front of his house? You know, why should we as the district pay for his sewer? Well, at some point, his sewer is new and your sewer is going to be old, and we'll come back and need to replace your sewer, so now Michael is paying for your, right. the slip lining of your sewer or your maintenance. So it's, you know, it's mm -hmm. kind of the collective whole is paying to, you know, for the benefit of, of Penfield you know, as a group. So. Yeah, right now we're all paying for his new sewer, you know, for his neighborhood and the cost, he's paying for it as well, but, you know, it comes back around that you know, we're continually need to do upgrades and maintenance and, you know, we've got flush trucks and everything else to maintain it, so. I don't know if it's more about sanitary sewers than you ever wanted to know, but. 
it's, it's, it's not a it's not a pure science, but it's just yeah. kind of. But you know, but you're right though. It, it does drive the process for higher density. It kind of grows organically. Yeah. We don't ever say, as Jim said, you know, we're going to put sanitary sewer from here to here as a town. We don't typically do that. It comes yeah. through. A developer comes in and says, "Hey, I want to do this project," and we go, "Okay, well, sanitary sewer is over there. If you want to get there, you got to go, you know, through this. <laughs> and if you're going to go that way, you're going to, you know, size it, you know, so the other people can tie into it." And, um, so I say. Our system kind of grows organically, and then you know, we inspect it to make sure it meets our standards and sizing and everything else. Then we'll take ownership of it. They turn it over to us after you know, they built it. Now we own that piece, and then you know the next person comes in. So we don't have. And I don't know if Henrietta does it any differently, but we don't do any. You know, we're going to add sanitary sewer for two miles on this road to you know yeah. set up for development. You know to you know to push development. Right. Um, you know we're more reactionary in that, but at least we try to be ahead of it with plans and studies to look at, are we at capacity, do we have issues, is there restrictions in the... In well, the Pet Pet yeah, Pet feels like Henry, I mean, they're desirable neighborhoods to, or desirable yeah. towns to live in, yeah. so there's no pressure on us to want to draw people here, they're coming oh, on their no, own. No, no, I'm not you, suggesting... You, no, no, I, yeah. I, I, I'm yeah. just saying you get to other places... We got enough uh, bonds. You get to other towns where people exactly. are just, the, the town is begging people to come to it for all sorts of reasons for right. school, district, whatever the case might be. They are actually putting sanitary sewers in to entice people to come to live in those communities. So that probably would not happen in Penfield anytime while we're around. So. I have one in my front yard. You like going in your front yard? No, I have one. Oh, you do. Pump yeah. station, crossbow. Okay. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's funny, every time it really, really, really rains, it gets. That's the one we have issues with. Yeah. We found one the landscaping is beautiful, of course. <laughs> it is a great job. Well, we found one manhole that was below grade, so basically we were draining in the area around it. They've raised that yeah, up. It might help you a little bit. And then actually we have <laughs> plans to go in and seal the manholes. We're just getting such, the manholes are basically leaky. It's called I and I or inflow and infiltration. So basically when it rains, the, the manholes aren't tight enough that the water is just bleeding into them. Mm -hmm. So it flows in, so you get a heavy rain event, it just overwhelms the pump stations. We're actually have plans to go in and reseal coat the manholes in your neighborhood or that, that drainage okay. basin which should then just keep sanitary sewer, sanitary sewer, and storm sewer, storm sewer. Right now, you know, they're just combining together, and the, those pumps can't handle the Crazy. flows. You know, they run a rain event. They run, they run hose up to the next station, mm -hmm. and then... The existing pumps, they're just, it pumps up yeah. into Beacon Hills. It just doesn't have enough head at that. But you either have high speeds and, or high pressure, and you kind of work one versus the other. So if we can run it on a hose down, you don't have to pump the head up. To lift it and pump it, you can just you can pump more volume and keep up with the flow from the storm sewer, or the existing mm -hmm. rainwater, or pump the head. But we're working on trying to reseal those manholes and hopefully keep the water out. And I always feel bad for those DPW guys. They have to sit out there like a lot of them yeah. over hours and hours. They're, they're, in, the middle, they're in the middle of the night and yeah. they got you know generators to you know if there's power outages to keep. Yeah, pump stations the generators running. around to keep a lot of things going. So that's another requirement is where we now require. Uh, generators come with new pump station, so this one at home leasing will have a dedicated generator right with it. Yeah, it probably it still needs maintenance, but it's not a guy, you know, at 2 a.m., yeah. you know, <laughs> towing a generator behind him, plugging it in, pumping it down, driving to the next one. So then at least if you, back to refuel it. Yeah, at least if you've got a dedicated you know, generator with it, you know, we're standardizing around that as well to make sure we've got you know, redundancy. It's happened. It's been a while since they've had to leave the generator out there. So there's no county transmission mains. There is. It's down. Yeah. In, it's down in the Panorama Valley. Valley. It's an 84 inch intersection that runs through uh, yeah. Hilbert Park. It kind of cuts the corner down there, so the southeast part of our community flows south and into Parrington, mm -hmm. um, which then hits the interceptor. Um, so it goes into Parrington, but it's not treated. The north, kind of north of Plank Road, flows to Webster, okay. um, and then Webster has, uh, you know, its own treatment plants, whether village or town. That's where the upgrades are coming. And then, kind of mid central and west of our town, all flows west, kind of down to Panorama off of, you know, um, so Empire there, down that yeah. way, and all go down to the interceptor, and it runs along the east side of the. Okay. So the, there's the, your own the bay. Other, yeah. Yeah, you're looking at the one in purple. That's the big yeah. one. So there's your only other chance for extension, per se, but there again, doesn't go far. You're in a floodplain. Yeah, so really, you can see it runs northwest and runs along through Ellison Park and then it runs up along uh, the bay and then you know, eventually heads towards <coughs> Van Lair. It's like 
by in Henry Avenue that why <laughs> there was so much development on the west side of town because of the transmission main up along the river. For instance, going down to Van Lair. Yeah, that's where that eighty four inch that's where it goes as well. It's going to be yeah. It. It's yeah. so big. But everything else is going to Phillips Road. It's a good field trip, right? Pump <laughs> yeah, uh, treatment no. plant. Mm -hmm. Not a community tour. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can have it drained out and walk through. I mean, let's so uh, I want to jump over to uh, Route 250 and Pembroke Drive in that area. All right. Reset what I just had. There aren't many left, but we don't have that many really that we're overly concerned no. by. This is an interesting yeah, part, so. Sure, quick, just while you're on 250. Yep. So, 250 is a busy two lane road as it is. Thinking ahead, if sewer comes in and now you've got new housing complexes, you've got the monstrosity planned at 250 in Atlantic, you've got the senior folks homecoming and, and all kinds of other stuff potentially in the docket. How do we ensure that doesn't turn into Route 96 going into Victor where it's a parking lot? <clears throat> well, a lot of uh, what we'll see right now is a lot of the lands are developed already, and anything that would happen for development would be redevelopment in this case. There are a couple little pockets. That well, he's talking about. to the mixed use there in the middle. Oh, the mixed use. Well, I mean, through that we've done traffic studies. I think you're going to see. Yeah, you're going to see. The one thing you're going to see is you're probably going to see a lot of those units are going to be dedicated to seniors. <sighs> So it's in, in, and again, seniors are 50 years and older, or 55 years and older. So they're not. It's not like they're not working or anything, but a lot of them won't be working, and a lot of them won't be going out during peak periods in the morning and the afternoon. You're still going to see more traffic. I mean, people don't get the fact that Penfield's only half developed right now. I mean, there's there's a lot of area. If this, if this were 1979, and they didn't change that zoning, you'd have housing tracks all over East Penfield that we don't have today. Um, which would be a lot more uh, dense than it is now, and you probably have more schools in these, in Penfield than you do. There's now. there's also a lot that goes into the monstrosity that you referenced. Um, it with that comes multi-phase traffic improvements to allow with deceleration lanes, turn turn lanes. Uh, no traffic lights at this time, but that project, for example, Single has four entrances changes. into it. So immediately you change the character of 215 Atlantic when you get there because you're going to add some deceleration lanes and turn lanes to get in. Then you're going to look at, as Mark just said, retiming the lights as you approach that area so you have proper gapping of the vehicles that already travel there. So as you go south, there's a couple of traffic lights all the way down uh, to the Y, to Wayland Road. They're looking at that area to make sure that's timed properly as it's built out so that it gets, we're not waiting for it to get built and then say, oh no, we didn't do anything with traffic. No, we had to do a traffic wide, an area wide traffic study to implement a pro to, to implement a project like that if it came back in. Well, when they put that Ryan track in um, Atlantic and Five Island, what traffic improvements did you make? They didn't have to do any because they, they widened, uh, they gave us a little more right away for future improvements at the intersection of Atlantic 250 because that's 86 homes. In the world of traffic, that is a drop less, in the bucket. Less than 100 homes, the DOT will not even look at it. They said it is not even on their radar. If it's less than 100 homes, they won't even bother. So that was 86 homes that went into that. Um, we looked at taking additional right away, as Zach said. Um, we have been talking to the state DOT about doing improvements to the five mile um, Atlantic intersection. We know that you know there's been accidents there, there's been issues there. Um, you know, so that is. Why they were pushing uh, drills in there? Uh, because the they're looking at what they're doing to that intersection. Is if they're doing road widening, if they're doing you know other improvements. Yeah, they're doing boring tests out there to see what the bearing capacity is. You know what other issues are in the area. They're looking at utilities in the area. Uh, there's gas infrastructure. If you see a you know gas regulating station on the corner. So the DOT is in their planning process or design process for you know what that improvement is going to look like. Was that was that one of the intersections yeah. that was and designated as a, a failing intersection? Though? Yes. Okay. Before we get too far, Mike, let's finish your thought. Thank you. So yes. I can appreciate the traffic studies are <clears throat> yeah. done for each project, but if we're looking ahead over ten years, should we not be taking a more comprehensive look at certainly the entire yeah. structure yeah. just per project? That's but why we we've have done that before. So okay. before mixed use started, we actually did a two fifty corridor study. Up and down through Penfield and towns to the north and south. There was a I mean, it went from Webster to Victor. To Victor. Okay. So there is a so there was a base corridor study that's done through all of that. When was that done? 2012. Okay. 
not sure. not too far away. Yeah, you know, don't because, quote me on the exact date, but it because was... mixed use was a recommendation in 2010, as was the corridor study. So okay. um, I think that's, you guys put that up on our files that we yeah. saw. So, right. Yes, yeah, on our website. Yeah. Oh. This, all that stuff is available. And to your point, there there's times just like the sanitary sewer comprehensive studies to look at what overall capacities in the town, same thing applies to traffic too, okay. to see like how say, those roads are working and how they could work in the future. As these first two developments go in, I can see us going back and updating that study, saying, okay, is this the vision that we had? Is this the amount of traffic that we, you know, as you look ahead in a traffic study, same as others, you, you do projections and you look at you know, what the growth of the area is, what the projected development is, so we'll do an update to that study and say, okay, is this what we had envisioned during that study, and you know, does that make sense? Do we need to update and tweak that? Um, you know, so we try to keep our you know, our studies current as far as what's out there, and you know, to dust them off. I mean, we use them every day, but uh, make sure they're updated as traffic, you know, things change, and who knows where we go with. It's not just us. The county of Monroe <laughs> does this with its roads. Uh, well, the Genesee Transportation Council is the regional. Right. That's who we got the money from to do the mixed use. NYS DOT is constantly looking at their, their numbers too to see what's going on. And they're constantly looking at accident reporting and finding out why things are happening the way they're happening. And that they see something that's going on, it's the same kind of accident over and over and over again. They're looking at for safety measures to try and resolve but that. <coughs> your, your point is very well taken. I mean, it's always the struggle. I mean, you've got 96 that's a two-lane road and it has traffic backups and issues, and then you've got 441, which used to be 96, and then you made it two lanes. So it's a if you build it, they will come kind of thing as well. So it's it's always a, a give and take. If you just add more lanes, then people this is an easier, faster route, and then more people will develop at the end of that and, and grow at that. So I know that's kind of what Victor's struggling with is if they make 96 a four-lane highway through there, yeah, for 10, 20 years it'll be open and things will be flying. Um, but then that'll spur on more development on the other end of it, and they'll be back to you know, kind of where they are now. So it's you know, definitely well, something we, we keep looking at and evaluating is, you know, 441 has changed the character of the four corners. Um, you know, it was, it was necessary and needed, but, you know, you've lost that four corners, you've lost that, you know, that, that feel of, you know, kind of a you know, town center, you know, through some of that, you know, through, you know, those additional traffic impacts. but. Um, you know, unfortunately, <coughs> as we keep coming back to, we can't prohibit people from developing their property. Mm -hmm. That's going to happen whether we plan it or not. So that's why <coughs> we continue to try to plan ahead of it. If we just do nothing and say, you know, we'll just let it be what it is, it's going to develop out and, you know, it, it's going to happen no matter what. It's, you know, we, just, we try to be proactive and look at it and study it and, you know, is there a way to make it better than, you know, just whether more track housing or at least we're, if we are providing housing, we know it's a great community. People want to come here. Um, we want to provide the products and housing types that people are going to like. Or if we do nothing, then you know we'll continue with kind of more you know, cookie cutter single family house developments. If that's what we want, you know, that's great. But unfortunately, we know what's going to happen. You know, whether we like it or not, people have a right to develop their property. It's just, you know, do we? plan ahead and try to have a little bit of guidance with that. Sure. I'm not advocating for stopping growth or development or anything <laughs> no, like that. Just taking the traffic considerations into mind. Is there anything right. we could do well, to provide? So I said it was a great comment and then, uh, yeah. was, we've spent a lot of time on it. It's, yeah. a, it's a good discussion and as we're looking at it. And I was just we're reminded we're by our website crew that all these studies are right here, plans and studies. Um, <laughs> this is under, engineer, under plans and studies on the engineering section of a lot of those types of studies you're talking about, um, comprehensive, uh, a comprehensive look at an okay. entire area. So the latest one was the 250, the 286 is Atlantic Avenue. Um, that one was done in 2000. That one would be updated if and when, you know, obviously the state does improvements on Five Mile Atlantic. If you could tend to update that study. Um, and then go down, you got the 404 corridor, which is Empire Boulevard. Um, obviously, um, if you haven't seen the state DOT is getting ready to start doing a mill and Repave on Empire Boulevard. They're adding some turn lanes in there and doing some improvements to that piece. But our studies and working with conjunction with uh, both GTC and the state DOT, um, you know, I think helps them plan and it helps you know, us advocate for turn lanes. We're getting a turn lane at at uh, Plank and Empire. Um, if you've ever gone you know, starting to head down Empire, turning the left on a Plank Road, it's a much needed left-hand turn. You know, to have a defined turn pocket for it. So we had the study. We can pull it out to the state and say, hey, you know. 
the study calls for it, and what would make sense is you're redoing this road to incorporate some of these initiatives into it. So that kind of helps us to kind of take them along a little bit and say, hey, you know, let's look at this now and let's you know, add this in there. And we meet with them annually. We just met with them recently to, you know, keep reminding them, hey, we're over here and don't forget about us. And you know, while you're looking at these areas, let's, you know, let's make some improvements. Yeah, and I would just add, it, it's, it is challenging. Um, there's also some irony involved. I mean, I, I think I'm asked on a regular basis, you know, <coughs> why is 441 a four-lane highway? Well, it it has been for a long time, and now if you look at, like Mark and Jim said, if you look at trying to shift the, the, the pendulum to 26, 286, what do you do with Atlantic, and do you make it a four-lane road? Well, then it's going to turn into 441 at some point. So, it, the, you know, it is a challenge. What I also say is Supervisor La Fountain has done a great job interacting with state DOT. He's one of the few supervisors that meets with them at least once a year, maybe twice a year, to talk about development that the town has sort of on the horizon, whether it's at 250 or elsewhere, and shares with them where we are, where future development, where pinch points are, where residents are complaining about different aspects of traffic, and relaying that information to state DOT. State DOT ultimately is going to do what they do. Um, I'd like to think, and this committee has already had a handful of conversations about the future of transportation in 10, 15 years from now, what does that look like? Do we need parking lots and everything else? I'd like to think at some place in New York State, State DOT is having the same conceptual ideas of do we need to have four-lane highways everywhere? <coughs> How they are, in my interaction with State, State DOT, they are 100% bureaucratic. It's all by the numbers. So they will look at the data here in 2023 and decide what to do with Route 250, even if in 2033, 250 is no longer necessary. <coughs> that's just my, that's my experience in interacting with state DOT all the years. So it's, it's a challenging thing. We try to do the best we can with, you know, and, and I think it, Empire Boulevard is a perfect example. I think at least in my 10 years on the board, we have shared countless experiences of how we need to widen the bottom of the bay down there in the LaSalle's LaSalle uh, Sand Landing District. And sure enough, they're coming in and State DOT is going to basically remill and repave and restripe the road from the Penfield Webster line all the way to the Penfield Arondequoit line, actually up to 590. Road, but they're not going to address the one area where we've had the most concerns over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And again, their data does not justify doing what we believe as a town they should be doing. So it's going to be an ongoing battle, um, but again, you, you have to be very diplomatic and polite in how you engage in that battle because at the end of the day, they they decide to do what they want to do. So. We've seen some changes in the state, oh, which and, is good. I just want to add one, one, sure. one, I mean, everyone knows that the traffic light here at uh, Atlantic and Jackson Road, it, I mean, it's been in now for about eight, nine years. It took about 40 years of administrations to complain about that one same spot. And the traffic light is finally in, so eight years ago. But the YMCA has a traffic light, and that was there within the first seven or eight years. So it, again, it just goes back to wherever they are on the queue and whatever data they have and whatever, however they want to, you know, react to that. So. Sorry, Mark. But going back to Mike's uh, initial point, though, I, I think one thing that maybe we can try to consider are, are there things that, that we, within our purview um, as a town, can do to sort of mitigate certain, you know, like if a development should have two access points or one access point, or if speed limits should be this much or this much, that we should, we should, I hopefully we will know what's within the purview of, us, of our, not well, necessarily our group, but, but the town as a whole. That goes back to what uh, Rob was just saying. We do not have any control over the state highways as it relates to speed limits or uh, access points. They determine what's most appropriate based on what their data drives for them. We have that situation when we deal with the town roads. We well, that's what that. I mean, though. I mean, yeah, we do that. I mean, yeah. all of our town roads are at 25 miles an hour, so we do that. Uh, the town board has control over if somebody wants a, a loop driveway versus a single driveway. There has to be good rationale as to why that should occur. Um, and the county of Monroe has been good working with us over the years as to, uh, you know, speed limits and that type of thing. 
But it really does go back to the state. They drive the process in terms of what occurs on these high-speed highways that we have. Uh, we have three, basically. We have, we have uh, 441, we have 286 out here, and we have 404 and Fire Boulevard. They have control over those three highways. We got 250. I'm sorry, did I miss 250? We got Blossom River. And, and those no, three east-west are, are over 20,000 cars a day. Yeah. So one, one other thing, to your point, uh, the town does have some tools in place. LUAMP is one, and as you kind of maybe head down to the 250 corridor, you guys can pull that up. So as some of those new properties across from Wegmans, for example, are developed, the idea is to reduce the egress off of 441 and have access from the back. And that's, that's in place. So the town does have some opportunities. You're seeing sort of the same initial stages now with the, the mixed-use development where there's going to be a, a an access road that sort of comes out between the Y and the new property and kind of is going to come up the back side right. and hopefully alleviate some of the traffic <coughs> off 250. It's never going to alleviate all the traffic that ultimately heads west into Rochester um, down either Atlantic or um, 441, but at least there are some opportunities. And, and the other, not only does state DOT control sort of the traffic and, and the roadways itself, but they control the rights of way. And so when it comes to traffic calming measures or anything like that, the town can't even go in and plant trees if it wants to help, you know, when they have more objects in a right of way, it helps by natural just slow things down. We, we don't even have the option of doing that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, we constantly have these conversations with State DOT. We try to work with them where we can. I know when they sort of lowered the crest of the hill by Wegmans um, years ago and sort of made the changes there at 250 and 441. You know, some town, uh, you know, uh, feedback was put into consideration there with sort of how the intersection was ultimately designed. But at the end of the day, again, it's just it's 36,000 cars. They have to move them, you know, down 441 as fast as they can. So. Well, as Rob said, I mean, we do have a fairly good relationship with them. Um, and they do listen to a lot of our, you know, when we made recommendations regarding consolidation of access points in the 441 250 area, they were supportive of that. And they worked with us to uh, achieve that uh, through the permitting process. So some good things have come out of that. As I said earlier, the state is changing a little bit. I mean, before they were bigger, wider is better and faster, and get you from A to B. Um, if anybody's going up Panorama Trail going into East Rochester, they've done what's called a road diet. Basically says the traffic isn't there necessitating to have four lanes, so they've shrunk it down, added some bike lanes, done some other things. So it's good to see the state going back and reassessing it. We talked about that on Empire Boulevard and said, could we do a road diet on Empire Boulevard and would help slow traffic down? Basically said, you know, once you get above 25,000 cars a day, it doesn't work anymore. We were, we were at 29 at the time. You'd get such a platoon of cars, you'd never have any gap for anybody to get off the side road. You just have such a solid stream of flow down the hill that anybody trying to get in at the side would never get in or out. You wouldn't have gapping from the light. So, um, again, it's a challenge for us. We don't have jurisdiction over them. Any intersection that they uh, run into, that's their light. They, they control the whole intersection, whether it's the state or the county, and then it goes down to the county. Once the county has an intersection with our road, the county has jurisdiction over it. So the town of Penfield does not own a traffic light. Any traffic light you pass through is either the state or the county DOT. We don't own one. Um, you know, just to kind of give a, a relevance of, of what's out there, our roads intersect with them, um, but all of our traffic lights are owned by either the, the state or the county that's out there. So we kind of fall down in the the pecking order a little bit. And I know roundabouts are starting to become popular, at least talked about. Is that saying Penfield would propose? Does the state mandate that? How does that fit in? Uh, the state's going to do what the state's going to do. Um, we obviously, you know, continue to have conversations with them and say, you know, here's spots that, you know, may make sense. Here's spots, you know, as we meet with them and, you know, again, kind of put a bug in their ear and say, we're supportive, we're not supportive, you know, we'll help you out with it, you know. Uh, but again, you know, the state's here and you know, we're kind of down here. If they decide this is the spot for a roundabout and this is what's going to happen, um, you know, fortunately, unfortunately, they, <coughs> they're going to do what they're going to do. Um, you know, we just try to keep the lines of communication open. We, you know, have conversations and keep in touch with the county DOT. Um, so at least hopefully before a decision's made, we at least, you know, can put our voice in the room and have a conversation with them about what's going on. 
share what do we see as coming as the future, what do we see as development, what do we see what's going on. Um, we meet annually with RGE as well, and you know, where do they, you know, for a while, you know, it seemed like gas and electric were unlimited. They've got, their own quick, yeah. they've got their own restrictions, so we bring them in annually and say, okay, here's where we see development. What issues, concerns, you know, limitations do you have? Um, we have conversations with the Water Authority. You know, where do they have water service? Where, are they, you know, where do they have pressure issues? Obviously, rec recently, semi-recently, they ran that east side main off of Basket Road. And fed in, it comes right you know, just by the YMCA property and ties in a 48-inch water main. So they were trying to backfeed the east side of Penfield and you know potentially beyond you know, from there. So we kind of try to keep in touch with what the other agencies are doing and thinking, and at least they're aware of you know what we see as a vision for our community and where we're going. To hopefully we can work together. Good tangent. Good. <laughs> the conversation. It's not really a tangent. I mean, it's it's the crux of everything that we do. It's, it's planning. It's it's uh, sanitary source and drainage and traffic. Light tangent. How's that? Light tangent. <laughs> We only have a couple left. Um, one area that's kind of jumped out at us, and, and this kind of goes back to your comment, and this is where I was going when we got off to the next few. So, luckily, I guess you could say the 441 250 area is kind of maxing out now. There are a couple spots left um, that are vacant. Uh, one of the sites I'm looking at right now, it's, it's an interesting situation. Uh, several years ago, there was a single family home on 2039, which is right there. Uh, that is next to Sarah Jane Clifford's Gymnastics Training Center. <coughs> and across the street, there's a, uh, I believe, a daycare center. Um, intersection. Though. At, at the intersection of Pembroke and uh, 250. Uh, the question really was, um, should this stay a single family residential use, or should it be converted over to something similar to what Sarah Jane has in terms of commercial activity? And the reason why it comes up is because we've been trying now for a period of time to try and, and tie these properties internally uh, to one another to get to that intersection uh, as, and get it signalized at some point in the future. Right now, it doesn't meet the warrants, as we talked about the state and what it requires. It doesn't meet the warrants for an intersection improvement for signalization. But if this were to be redeveloped in such a way where we could get access to that intersection, and bring these properties tied together so they could have an alternate means of access to a signalized intersection, it might be something worth looking at. So we'll take a look at that and go out and see what you think in that area. I mean, this, this is what Rob was talking about a LUAMP. This is that land use and act we call LUAMP. Right. Land use and access management plan is years ago sat down and said, okay, these properties should be interconnected, so at least you have back access drive. So if you're going from, <coughs> you know, Platinum Office Park, you can get over to your doctor's office and, um, Parkside Commons, or you can, you know, without having to go out, you know, go on to 250 and then loop back in one driveway over, you know, loop back in. Um, the one little nugget in the middle of that is the federal government, you know, has a post office in the middle of it, and they don't like anybody touching their property, so they're not connected. They're connected in the front, um, you know, but we, we looked at connecting in the back, yeah, and they go, no, this is a fence yard area, <coughs> you're not touching it. And they're even a higher level than we are, but at least we got a connection in the front, so you can connect to, you know, Penfair Office Park, um, you know, is connected in the front to the, the post office. If you got to go to the post office to, you know, the plaza to Subway to, you know, over to, you know, Aldi's or something. At least you can kind of do that through plaza areas, and again, hopefully that relieves some of the traffic on uh, 441 and, and 250. You're not, you know, as you're running your errands, you know, you're you know, going out and making lefts and you know, <coughs> additional areas of conflict. You can see that every single area that's been developed in that in that quadrant has tied into another property adjacent to it, so you, you don't have to go out on the road. You can stay internal and not go out on the road if you don't have to. And I know, I mean, traveling down Ridge Road or some others, and if you've got individual businesses that were built up over the years and you can't get there from here, you go out and then all of a sudden, you know, you can't get to the neighboring properties and <laughs> You had to go out and loop around and come back, and it's can't it's, even walk to have fun. It's frustrating as a. You know, as a so that's one site I want to look at with you. Get your input on. Coming back. Uh, there were some properties up there along. There's four or five properties, six properties actually, that are abutting across from uh, Elderwood Senior Facility. They are currently single-family homes. They're in great shape. They take great care of their property. Um, I don't know if that's going to be true ten years from now or not, but that's something to look at as an option as well. Uh, they have but the park to the rear. I say that's our land. 
<laughs> and are those three properties that abut the uh, MR district uh, on the other side of the street. So we'll take a look at those and get your thoughts on that. Uh, can you just pull down to where McDonald's is in that area? Because I just want to show them again. Yeah. With the town boards done and the planning boards done in terms of trying to tie everybody together, um, you can see access coming in off <coughs> Penfield Road. All those properties are now internally tied together. And that will continue on well, down to the south as time started, goes on. They're all this. tied together. So theoretically, you would never have to go down the Fairport Nine Mile Point Road if you were to head east from here onto Penfield Road. So there is a, a real cool. push to get this. The goal is to get these properties tied together in commercial zoning districts to keep you from having to go out onto the main road and come back in. And even the goal here with BNR, trying to tie that in. Yep. To eliminate some of the curb cuts on Penfield Road. And that's a good example of uh, properties that were single family residential that lost their value as homes and now have been rezoned to BNR business non retail and now are, are viable, uh, important properties uh, that are being well maintained as commercial properties. They've been repurposed, they haven't been redeveloped necessarily. Right. The last one I have, uh, if we go down to Elms Creek Valley, this is probably the easiest one of the evening for you. <laughs> For some reason, back like in the early 80s, um, and I think what it was, was I'm not certain we even had a townhouse zoning district at the time, but we had a multi-residential zoning district. So where Ellis Creek Valley townhouses are located, they're located in an MR zoning district, but they're all townhouses. So I'm thinking that it might be appropriate after 30 or 35 years now to maybe change the zoning to uh, townhouse development, because that's what they are. On the same with Sable Oaks across and the way. And the same thing with Sable Oaks as well. At least that upper area. Where the town That's where are. Ellison Heights went in. There was an upper road, if you road up at the top, which it was um, designed so there's townhouses up top. And then the lower areas, the Ellison Heights um, four story buildings, is kind of the new section that's gone below that. It's this little sliver up there. Which one of the DNR like um, piece? Yeah, right. Right there? That's, yeah, that's. That's Dolomite's corporate headquarters. Ah. <laughs> so that's kind of, I'm saying an island of its own, but it's just kind of been there. It's been there forever. Transitional. Why don't the other ones be? Those are the, top, the, the highlights. So that's. So there aren't that many, and some of them may not warrant any consideration. Some may. But uh, we'd like to get you out in the field on a nice night and uh, just kind of look at everything and get your feeling on them. And you may have other areas that you may stumble across if you browse a map looking at our zoning and if that's something, if something comes up, whether it's just looking at residential to residential or something else, write it down and let us know. Um, so, yeah, you're going to talk about what I think you're going to talk about. Yeah, just looking ahead, um, our next scheduled meeting is May 21st. Do we want to see her go out and do a field trip and look at some of these properties and drive around? Um, it's going to be about 45 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> we got heat. Probably not May 21st. <laughs> do you want to bet on it? So first the question is we want to go on tour and I can obviously see if we can get a rec van and we can ride together and drive around and you know, look at some of these spots. and we'll get a couple know, if we have a View the area. And, and, and we may need more than one depending on, you know, we'll do a a check of how many people are coming and what the availability is. The second is, if we're going to do that and it's May, we're getting to longer days of the year, but a 7 to 9 meeting, 9 might be getting a little late. Would 6 o'clock or something slightly earlier work for everybody to meet here, go from 6 to 8 instead, just so we've got daylight hours or 5, whatever, and I just put it out to it the It doesn't group. have to be 2 hours either. It doesn't have to be 2 hours either, but just earlier. as we start at 7 and you know, the light's fading and it'll be lighter than it is now. Yeah. Um, I just don't want to get too light or too late. You know, we're, I mean, right now it's twilight. I don't, I don't see that property we're talking it's about. It's 8.30 and, you know, we're trying to look at properties <laughs> and everything else. So I'm just kind of floating out, you know, would 6 o'clock work for the group? Yes. 5.30? No. 6 o'clock? Okay. Uh, so we'll schedule 6 to 8 and we'll send that out to the rest of the group for next time. Um, I'll work on scheduling at least one um, recreation van. We'll meet here as we do for a standard meeting and then leave out of our parking lot and plan a route and start driving around and you know, look at spots. Obviously, in between now and then, you're welcome. Feel free to drive around and start taking a look yourself. 
as you're driving around other areas, as Zach said, mark it down, you know, areas you say, hey, what's this over here? Or, hey, what's going on with that? And let's come back and look at the zoning. What is it? Does it need our zoning? Should it be something else? You know, we'll talk about it. I'm sure we'll get more requests as you know we continue to have conversations and you know these are broadcast. We'll get we'll continue to get requests from other groups. We'll kind of keep a tally of those so at least we can say. Um, you know, we at least looked at them, whether the group, you know, suggests any change or not, at least people can say, you know, the group did, you know, take it under consideration, did evaluate, you know, what they had requested and go from there. I'm just going to real quick one that I've always wondered about, sure. just out of your curiosity, yeah. the biker hangout across from the Y, is that just a, is that a private residence? Is that like a club? It's a single family house <laughs> that operates, and you probably have more history than I do, is a, is a biker club that it's 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 uh, the Iron Horsemen. They've been here forever. They've been here way longer than I have. They did purchase that house back in the '70s. Um, they live as a single-family residence. And under state law, you can do that. You have to prepare your meals in one common kitchen area, and you have to eat in one dining area, which they do. Um, they obviously are not related by blood, but you don't have to be under state law. But they've been there for a long time, and uh, yeah. they they act as a single-family right residence. Oh, yeah. Partial to and um, I, mean, I think there's one guy that lives there most of the time, and then on special events or days, I know they actually have a good relationship with the YMCA. Um, they usually have a big bike ride rally in the summertime, and the YMCA lets them use their parking lot. And um, you know, so for you know, one small period during the year, they have like, you know a bigger rally. But other times, I believe there's only one guy that you know, lives in the house kind of year-round. And they actually have a good relationship with their next door neighbors too. <laughs> Gentlemen bikers, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, the I mean, answer, that's a good. That's a very good question. Stuff uh, they are a single. They are considered to be a single family residence. Yes. I mean, right now they're re, as part of our mixed use rezoning. They've been rezoned to mixed use. Um, that doesn't preclude them from operating as a single family residence. But you know, if they were ever to redevelop or do something else with it, you know, they'd fall under the mixed use zoning requirements of you know, doing something else with the property. But, they can continue as anybody else in the district, you know, continue on. There's a lot of single family houses in that district that'll continue to be single family probably for many, many years to come. Could we also just uh, see the mixed use development, the places that have been designated? Because uh, to get a sort of sense of the, like, the magnitude scale. of it, mm -hmm. the scale sure. of it, Absolutely. yeah, that would We can see good. anything you'd like. I mean, it, we're not limited to just going out and looking at these particular properties. Yeah. We can look at the whole town if you'd like. Yeah. Some of the things you might like to see also are some of the pre-existing non-conforming uses in town. Um, they're here and, you know, yeah, they're going to be here. Yeah. Might be interesting to see how they operate as well. Well, we'll try to come up with this. We can do that too. <laughs> we, will, we, we will stop. I promise you. <laughs> Whether it's for ice cream or coffee or whatever you want. Um, so we'll try to come up with a, you know, kind of a rough agenda, you know, areas we kind of plan on stopping and obviously as we loop around we can stop and pull off wherever sees fit. We'll bring our zoning maps and bring the code book and whatever other resources and have conversation as we drive around. And, and you might want to go out a second time. You don't know that if you decide to go out. Yeah. Yeah. If you're with us and see it then you definitely can go back on your own and see it again then you have a better feeling for it and like we mentioned earlier if there are these people with your bus and we want to bring somebody in we can Invite them and learn a little more. Good. Okay, so May 21st, 6 p.m. Just meet here. Starting here. Yep. Yeah. And then I say we may send out just a, a request tally of who's coming or who can't come, just so we know if we need one van or two vans. <coughs> or, you know, if we can all fit together, that'd be even better. Um, if we can't, you know, we'll split up accordingly. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we're